Well, Cascades, I love this Christmas season, and there's a lot of different reasons. I wonder if some of the ones I'm going to list off here are things that, for you, you love as well. See, at Christmas, I love pulling out the special Christmas candles. I know that sounds kind of cheesy, but I, I, we have this one candle. It's called this uh, Fraser Fir candle. It smells like a true Christmas tree. I love to light it. If I could, I would light it every day of December. Not a problem at all. It just smells so good. I love the smell of those fresh and warm baked ginger cookies. I love sweets. I love cookies. I will eat them up. A number of you know that because you give them to our family. And I have to practice self-control in sharing with my family and with Isaiah and Evan. I love how excited my kids are now that they're getting older to pull out the Christmas tree and to decorate it. I love gathering with our family and enjoying that Honduran Christmas. We celebrate on Christmas Eve. The meal that my mom preps is delicious. She started to include us in the process of making certain things, but honestly, hers is the stuff we're there for, right? I love creating that Christmas playlist, you know, you, and I love it all. I'll, I'll go like, yeah, sure, Michael Bublé or whatever, but I like those Christmas crooners, the old songs, and then I like you know, a little bit of Mariah Carey. I'm a little bit done with all I want for Christmas is you just because I feel like everywhere you go, you hear it, but it is a classic at this point. But for my kids, they're all about Jingle Bell Rock right now. Jingle Bell Rock, that's the song they want to hear on repeat. There are these songs, though, that go deeper, right? Those Christmas hymns. Those songs that we remember, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Songs that echo the glory and explain the significance of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And see, what I love about this Christmas season is we get to come back to a story. It's the story that grounds this season. All those things are great. I love them. But the story of Christmas is what moves me. The story of Christmas is what draws me back into the wonder of what happened. There's this song, a hymn. Some of you might know it. It was written by this woman named Catherine Hankey. She was an English missionary, nurse, and hymn writer. And it's called, I Love to Tell the Story. It goes like this. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. It'll go on to say, I love to tell the story for those who know at best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. See, you might know the Christmas story. You might have heard it year after year after year. Yet there is something within us that longs to hear it again because it really is good news of great joy for all people. This Christmas story, it fills us with wonder. And as we look back at the unexpected and extraordinary way God came to us in the birth of Jesus, it fills us with that delight once again. So let's go back to that story. We're going to be reading out of Luke chapter 1, starting in verse 26. Luke chapter 1. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. And she was greatly troubled at the saying, and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How will this be since I'm a virgin? The angel answered her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. 
And Mary said, Behold, I am the servant. I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Father in heaven, we thank you that you have come through your son, Jesus, to us. We ask that this morning your spirit would speak to us through these words and minister to us, remind us of this wondrous truth that you have come, that you are here, and that this really is good news for us. Have your way with us, we pray. Amen. Last week, Ryan spent time unpacking why God chose Mary, and he looked at Mary's Magnificat, and he highlighted three things, and he actually spent quite a bit of time drawing from this uh, passage. Those three things were that Mary was humble, that she was available to God, and she was hungry for God. There was nothing that really made her extra special, but she was humble before God. She was willing and available to be used by God, and she was hungry for him. This week, I would like to spend time looking at the wonder of Christmas as told by Gabriel. That's why we looked at what he said. You see, what makes Christmas so wondrous are the implications of of Gabriel's words to Mary. What makes Christmas so wondrous is the event that we celebrate of God coming to us and becoming one of us. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. How? The Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. The divine and the human human come together in Jesus, conceived by the Spirit but born to Mary. Jesus, the Son of the Most High and also the descendant of the King of David. He is the Son of God. This is what theologians call the incarnation. And why does it matter? Why is Christmas so wonderful? What makes it worth celebrating? Well, I want to offer three reasons this morning why it's so wonderful. The first is that God makes himself known in Jesus. The second is that God identifies himself with us. And the third is that God intends to put the life of his son in us. Let's look at this first one. God makes himself known in Jesus. See, Christmas is wonderful because it's at this point that God came into the world and made himself known through his son, Jesus. Listen to the words of Alistair McGrath. He says, no longer are we dependent upon descriptions of what God is like, passed down from one generation to another. God himself has come and has redeemed his people. God himself comes to us in the form of a person, Jesus Christ, setting aside his glory, power, and majesty. God humbled himself and stooped down in order to meet us where we are, in a form with which we could identify. Jesus reflects, echoes, and embodies what God is like. In short, Jesus is God in the flesh, God incarnate. Therefore, if you've ever wondered what God is like, you you look no further than Jesus. If you want to know how God interacts with sinners, you look to Jesus. If you want to know how God interacts with religious outsiders, you look to Jesus. If you want to know how Jesus interacts with those excluded from the temple, you look to Jesus. If you want to know how God interacts with the sick, you look at Jesus. If you want to know how God interacts with those who are immoral, you look at Jesus. If you want to know how God interacts with those who are mourning, those who are lonely, those who are hurt, the weak, you look no further than Jesus. He is God incarnate. This is why Jesus will tell Philip in John 14, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? If you have seen me, Jesus says, you have seen my Father. Jesus makes God known because he himself is God. He shows us the heart of the Father. He is the Son of the Most High. He is God with skin on. And it's for that reason that Paul, 
who after encountering the resurrected Jesus went from breathing hatred towards Jesus and those who followed him to preaching Jesus and making disciples of Jesus throughout the Roman Empire will say in Colossians 1 about Jesus, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. Everything was created through him and for him. See, Christmas is wonderful because God has come to us and made himself known in his son, Jesus. And it's for this reason that the author of Hebrews starts his letter saying, in the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through, through whom he also made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. The son is the radiance of God's glory, and he came and became human. He cried out like an infant child because he was an infant child. Gabriel himself, he'll say this. You don't even have to go that far into the, the New Testament. Just look at what Gabriel says in our passage. He says his name will be Jesus. Jesus was one of the most common names in the first century in Palestine. It's where we get the name Joshua. It would have been, his name would have been Yeshua, which literally means God saves. More specifically, Yahweh saves. Jesus will be and do what his name means. He will save. He is God to the rescue. And from what? What is he rescuing us from? To, he's come to save and undo the damage done by sin. Sin against ourselves, sin done against others, and sin done against God himself. God has come to save us from the sin that we have done against him. Sin alienates us. It separates us from God, and he's come to rescue us and restore us, but not just us, all of creation. And he's come to rescue us from evil, from all of the forces of evil that conspire to undermine and destroy God's good creation. And not just from evil, but also from death, to rescue us from that finality of death. Death does not have the same power anymore because Christ has come. We rejoice in that at Christmas. Gabriel also says, and the Lord will give to him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. The throne of David was language for the Messiah. God promised David that in the future, a future descendant of his would be the Messiah who would rule over Jacob, a.k.a. Israel, and his kingdom would never end. He, this Messiah, would bring God's good and righteous and peaceful reign on earth. And it wouldn't just be for Israel. It would be for all of the world. And that is who Gabriel is saying Jesus is. See, Gabriel is a messenger. That's what an angel is. He's a messenger for God. And so he is delivering what God is saying about Jesus. He will be the Son of God, the Son of the Most High. He will be the Messiah. See, Advent is this wonderful declaration by God that I have come. I am making myself known. I made myself known in the past through prophets, but now I am speaking to you through my Son. And I want you to know what I'm like. I want you to know what I have to say. And if you want to hear it, look to my Son. Look at his birth. Look at his life. Look at his words, look at his death, look at his resurrection, his ascension. At Christmas, we celebrate that God has come to us and made himself known in Jesus. So if you want to know what God is like, if you want to see him, if you want to experience him, you come to Jesus. The second reason why Christmas is so wonderful is that it is this declaration that God will identify with us. God identifies himself with us. See, Christmas is this startling declaration that God wants to, wills to, desires to identify with humanity, his creation. The gospel writer John put it like this, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And in verse 3, he'll say, through him all things were made. The word is God, 
The Word is the creator of all things. And shortly after, John will say in verse 14, and the Word became flesh. The creator God became flesh. The creator God became human. The visible, the invisible became visible. See, the moment divinity and humanity came together in Jesus, when he was conceived, was the moment that we knew we would be saved. The moment that divinity and humanity came together in the conception of Jesus was the moment that we knew we'd be saved. Daryl Johnson, he puts it like this. God took on our humanity and became one of us and always will be one of us. No going back, no divesting himself of our flesh. One of us forever. For in taking on our flesh, he affected the union of divinity and humanity. Divine divinity and humanity joined together forever in Jesus. Never to be disunited, not possible to be disunited. This is why we rejoice in Christmas. Now, so what? Well, it means that God is not distant. He's not physically distant. He's not emotionally distant. If God became human, he knows. He's experienced. He understands. He sympathizes with our lives. He doesn't just know about suffering. He has suffered. He doesn't just know about our struggles and disappointments. He himself has struggled and experienced disappointment. I remember one of the pastors uh, from Mexico that her name was Brenda. She worked many years among the Raramuri in the Copper Canyon in Mexico. And she shared about how every year she would be part of this team that would go into the Copper Canyon and get sick every time. She just didn't have the different immunities that they seemed to have in the canyon. So she'd get sick over and over again every time she'd go. And it would entail like having to pull off the path where they'd be hiking to puke. And the locals who would guide them through the canyon would see them get sick all the time. And one time, this guy's name is, is Antonio, he, he turned to Brenda and said to her, I know that you care because you keep coming back even though you get sick every time. You keep being part of the, what's going on here even though you're sick every time. See, Brenda didn't ride a mule though she could have while everyone else hiked. She didn't try to get comfortable despite being in uncomfortable circumstances. She wasn't too proud to get sick. She wasn't too proud to get dirty. She wasn't too proud to surrender her comfort. And that's exactly what Jesus does. He comes and surrenders his comfort. He is not too proud to get sick, to get disappointed, to experience suffering, to experience hardship, to get dirty. He is God, but he didn't count it equality with God. He didn't count equality with God something to cling to, to hold on to. Instead, he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men, as Paul writes in Philippians 2. He surrendered his glory and left his throne. He got dirty and sick and hurt. He knows what it is like. He experienced pain. See, God cares so much that he would send us his son, that whoever believes in him wouldn't lose their life but inherit eternal life. Jesus was tempted in every way that you and I are, but he resisted and never sinned. He sympathizes with us in our hardship, in our temptations. Hebrews 7 tells us that he lives to intercede on our behalf, even now. God identifies with us and willingly sacrifices for us. And it's costly, but it is central to the Christmas story that God identifies with us. And more than that, central to this story is a willing Savior. What do I mean by that? Well, Paul Tripp, he puts it like this. Jesus was willing to leave the splendor of eternity to come to this broken and groaning world. Anyone resonate with that line? <laughs> the broken and groaning world? 
He was willing to take on a human flesh with all of its frailty. He was willing to endure an ignominious birth in a stable. He was willing to go through the dependency of childhood. He was willing to submit to his own law. He was willing to do his father's will at every point. He was willing to serve when he deserved to be served. He was willing to be misunderstood and mistreated. He was willing to endure rejection and gross injustice. He was willing to preach a message that would cause him personal harm. He was willing to suffer public mockery. He was willing to endure physical torture. He was willing to go through the pain of his father's rejection. He was willing to die. He was willing to rise and ascend to be our constant advocate. He, Jesus was willing. You see, it's not just the Christmas story, rather the entire redemptive story that hinges on one thing, the eternal willingness of Jesus. And without his willingness, you and I would be without hope and without God. But at Christmas, we are reminded how willing indeed he is, that he is willing to come and become human, willing to live the life that you and I could not live. He was perfectly sinless. And he willingly laid down his life in our place. See, the lie that you and I get tempted to believe is that in our pain and loneliness, God doesn't care and cannot understand what we are going through. And when we believe that lie, we make all sorts of poor decisions. He doesn't understand me. He doesn't know what it's like. He doesn't feel what I feel. We get tempted to believe the lie that because I'm single or divorced or my marriage is broken, God just doesn't care. He can't understand what I'm going through. But he was single his whole life. He felt loneliness. His closest friends betrayed him. We get tempted to believe the lie that he couldn't understand my pain, yet he was nailed to a cross, whipped 40 times. He struggled to even breathe on the cross. He won't understand or relate to my embarrassment. He was probably crucified naked in an honor and shame culture that didn't look kindly at being publicly exposed. He was mocked by leaders and strangers alike. He knows what it is like to experience embarrassment. He won't understand my failures. He never sinned. Actually, he does. He does understand our failures. Despite never failing himself, never sinning, Jesus willingly took on the shame of all of our failures and the worst of their consequences upon himself. He felt that failure more than you have. At Christmas, we actually get this truth. It's, fl- it's flying in the face of the lies that he doesn't understand and he doesn't care. It's a time where we celebrate that he actually willingly identifies with us. He suffers for us and he dies for us. At Christmas, we rejoice in the willingness of Jesus to become one of us. He is eternally willing to come to you, to forgive you, to help you, to sustain you, to pray for you, to strengthen you, to encourage you, to teach you. So what area of your life do you need to hear that in right now? What area of your life do you need to be reminded of his willingness to come and meet you and to love you and intercede on your behalf? Because he's come to identify with you, to be with you. Come to him. He is gentle and gracious, and he is able to sympathize with you in ways you would never imagine. The third reason we rejoice and celebrate this Christmas season is that God intends to put the life of his son in us. Turn with me to verse 34. Look at what Mary says to the angel Gabriel. She says, how, how will this be since I am a virgin? The angel responds to her and says, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative, Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month with her who was called barren, for nothing will be impossible with God. What God does in Mary is a one-time, never-to-be-repeated thing. That will never happen again. But there is something for you and I, for anyone who will respond to the wonder of Christmas. 
See, at Christmas, we celebrate that what God announces to Mary is also a picture of what God intends to do with humanity. It is a picture of what God intends to do with humanity. What do I mean? Listen to the words of Daryl Johnson. He says, the life, the Zoe, Zoe of the unique, ungenerated, eternal life dwelling in the body, growing in Mary's womb, now dwells in anyone who belongs to Mary's son. Do you belong to Mary's son? If you do, the life, the Zoe, the unique, ungenerated, eternal life that was in Mary now is in you. The living God, the God of Mary, wants to put within each of our broken lives the very life of his son. Jesus would later say, live in me and I in you. They who live in me and I in them, they bear much fruit. Live in me and I in you. What an invitation from Jesus, from God himself. Live in me. The very life of God dwelling in mortal bodies. The same life-giving spirit that conceived Jesus in Mary is available to those of us who put their trust in Jesus. See, God isn't just content to live and dwell in a building. He's not content just to stay and dwell in heaven apart from humanity. He has come to earth among humanity to bring heaven to earth, to make us, his people, individuals, and gather together his dwelling place. It's not just enough to know about him. To hear the story, he wants you to encounter the one the story is about. That's why it's so wonderful. He wants you to experience this eternal life of Jesus dwelling in you and growing in you. And this picture of conception shouldn't be too surprising of us, for us if we know our Bibles. Because Paul will use this kind of language in Galatians 4. He says, my children with whom I labor until Christ is formed in you. That's conception language. Pause no problem using it when it comes to Christians because it's what the Spirit does in us. He births Christ in us. We were to be impregnated with, filled with the very life of Christ through the Holy Spirit. The God of Advent comes and promises to make us his dwelling place and transform us. He says, I will come to you in Jesus and dwell in you through the Spirit. My Spirit will move in you. He will change you. He will cleanse you. He will forgive you. He will fill you with power. You will actually have new desires. You won't desire the same things anymore. The power of sin and the crippling shame will actually be broken in your life. You will learn to think in new ways, to operate in new ways. And what I say about you will actually matter more than what others say about you. You will begin to look and love and serve like Jesus. You will forgive like Jesus, and you'll even suffer like him. Such news is too wonderful for us. And you and I actually ask, like Mary, how can this be? How is that even possible? How is it possible when I'm so resistant to change, when I'm so prone to wandering, to getting distracted? How can it be since I've struggled with the same sins my whole life? How can this be when I'm powerless to change things that enslave me? Well, you see, it's not about us and our apparent lack or what we're unable to do. We actually have to surrender ourselves to God. We think only in terms of what is humanly possible. So, of course, none of you are like, how? That doesn't make any sense. But the invitation is to actually enter into the realm of what is possible through God. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, Gabriel says. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Nothing will be impossible, impossible with God. The Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that was there in Genesis 1, creating something out of nothing, that out of the emptiness God creates and fills, now Gabriel is saying, in the emptiness of your womb, Mary, the Holy Spirit will come and create and fill it with baby Jesus, Emmanuel. This is the spirit that Luke will tell us in Acts 1.8. Jesus says these words, you will receive 
power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It's the same language. The Spirit that creates and brings new life in the beginning, the Spirit that comes and enables Mary to conceive, is the Spirit that comes to anyone who puts their trust in the Son of Mary. You receive power. And so if the Spirit is able to do that with seemingly nothing to work with, don't you think he can work with the apparent lack of power, holiness, joy, or courage that you have? If the Spirit can work with darkness and emptiness and bring about creative order and beauty in our world, don't you think he can work with the absence of courage and strength in ours? If the Spirit can bring the human and the divine together, creating Christ, the Son, the, in the womb, the baby, don't you think he can bring new life in our lives? Nothing will be impossible with God. The Spirit overshadows, comes upon, and marks you and I so that Christ can be birthed and formed in us. You and I can change, and our world can change when this Holy Spirit comes. So, I asked you, what is that area where you need to be reminded that he cares, that he understands and sympathizes? What is that area? It might be the very same area that right now just seems impossible. It seems impossible apart from God. Maybe it's a faith that's barely holding on. You're deconstructing and you don't know where you're going to land. You're, you have a fear about the future because you can't see where it's headed and you don't know how it's going to get better. Maybe you have a struggling marriage or just a stale marriage or a loveless marriage. And you're trying to make sense of how things will work out. Maybe it's your finances. And in this season, you're like, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. Perhaps it's health issues in your own life or a family member's life. Maybe it's grief that just feels so overwhelmingly heavy. It feels like it's crushing you. Perhaps it's just this hardened heart to others that just won't let anyone into the pain. What is it that feels like it is impossible? What we need to hear is that that same spirit is available for you and I. And our call is to respond, to see who is offered to us. See, the answer to the how is a who, the Holy Spirit. And Mary responds with these words, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it be to me according to your word. We don't have to understand everything. We don't have to understand how it will all work out, but we do need to be desperate for him. We do need him. So we've got to acknowledge our weaknesses and our inadequacies. We have to give up having to understand him completely. We have to give up the feeling, the illusion of control, and give up focusing on what is humanly possible. Take him at his word. See, there's two pictures of surrender that I was thinking about. One is this image of surrender where you just put up your hands and you give up in despair because of the circumstances, because of our experiences, because of the weight. It feels crushing. And so we give up. But there's another image of surrender that I think actually leads to life. And Mary gives us that picture. Because when she surrenders, she gives in to the message that she hears. She gives in to God. Our arms are raised, but only because we know that he is actually embracing us as well that he comes upon us in the spirit. You come to the one who has power to make something out of nothing. And he says the spirit will come upon you. Nothing will be impossible with God. See, the second image of surrender is you put your hands up, but you need to know that Christ comes and actually embraces you as well as you surrender. And he leads you into this new life. And it's from that place where you can experience, as you say, behold, I am your servant, Lord Jesus. Let it be to me according to your word that you experience the wonder of Christmas. That he cares, that he's made himself known to you, that he identifies with you, and he's going to fill you with his life. Father in heaven, like Mary, we want to fully embrace the meaning of Christmas, that you have made yourself known in Jesus. 
that you have identified with us in him and that you have sent him so that we would have his life in us. We thank you for the example of Mary, who, though she didn't understand everything, somehow was willing to surrender and give in to what you had for her, that nothing was, is impossible with you. Lord, we just acknowledge all the different ways in which we've been discouraged, tired, fearful. And what we want to do right now is just acknowledge that you actually understand it. You sympathize with us. You come. But you've also come to fill us with your life and your power. And so we just say that we surrender like Mary. We surrender whatever that area is where we have felt like hopeless in whether it's our finances or our health or a relationship or the future, God, we surrender and we say we don't have to know how it all work out, but we surrender to ourselves to you and say, would you lead us? You alone have the words of life. So lead us, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Cascades.